continue in our series on upgrade. And we started this off last week and, and kind of basing the, the, the series out of John uh, chapter 10, that, that scripture. And we went through the whole chapter last week. So if you missed the first part of the series, I encourage you to, to go online and you can uh, listen to that. But John chapter 10, uh, verse 10 says this. It says, the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you life. And that you may have it abundantly. And we talked about this last week that, that God doesn't want us just to exist and make it through life. But God wants us to thrive. You know, those, those words, uh, that word life means zoe. Which doesn't mean, you know, breathing life. You know, that you're physically alive. But it means life to the full. And it join us. And, and over an abundant life in, in life. And look, you don't have to have a, an overabundance in your bank account to live an overabundant life. Come on, how many of you say amen to that? Because we would, a, a lot of us would be ruled out of that. But you can live abundantly. And it's not based upon how much money that you have in the, in the bank account. And, you know, last week we talked about how God offers this better life. But a lot of times if you're going to walk in that, you know, it, it's going to cost you uh, more. It's going, it's going to cost you something. There's, there's going to be a, a price attached to it. And you remember when we talked about, uh, you know, my cell phone plan. And, uh, you know, I, I keep uh, an older uh, phone and, and I don't upgrade because I don't care if it takes me a while to open up things. It's just not worth the money to have to go buy the new phone every time it comes out and, and stuff. And so, you know, I, we talked about how sometimes people just aren't willing to pay the price to live in that abundance. And, and, and this year, I think that needs to be uh, a desire of our heart is that we have everything that God wants us to have in our life. That if there's a promise, if there's a, a, a lifestyle, if there's something that God promises in his word, that we go do it because we realize that if we're living abundantly, then we're going to make a bigger impact for his kingdom. Amen? And, and, so, and that's what the, the goal is about, is that God wants us to be the city on a hill that cannot easily be hidden, that people will see our good works, and it will bring glory to God. And when we just survive through life, then it, it doesn't bring the same glory to God. And so God has given us all the tools and stuff that we need to be able to, to thrive in life and not just survive. And, and, you know, some of you men, how many of you men have ever tried to, to do a project or ladies, you've tried to, to build something or do a project and you just didn't have the right tool? Anybody ever done that? You know, I remember when we moved up from Louisiana, we, uh, we basically, we lived in a, in a house in Louisiana that was about 3,000 square feet. And when we moved to Louisiana, or moved to West Virginia, we moved into a 900 square foot apartment. And so there was a lot of downgrading. We literally, if it couldn't fit in a U-Haul, we gave it away. Uh, and, and, you know, there was furniture and beds and, and just all kinds of stuff. And, 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 you know, I just told Melanie, I know the place is smaller that we're going. We had never seen the apartment we were moving into. And if we had, we may not have moved into it. But uh, it was just kind of one of those things. We were just temporarily going to move in and look for a house. And we eventually found a house about a year and a half later. Uh, and, but, you know, we were in that night. 900 square foot apartment, but you know, one of the first things that ladies like to do when they when they move to a new home is they want to make it feel like home. Come on, how many of you ladies can say amen to that? You you want to get your pictures up and and the furniture and you know the the little decorations and everything in place. And so we still had boxes that had yet to be unpacked. We had to take some of the boxes and move them to a storage unit, and then just gradually bring a box and and work it in at a time. Well, in those boxes was my drill, and my wife decided that she wanted to have all of the pictures and mirrors and everything like that up, and some of these mirrors were not just something that you could just put a little nail in the wall or anything like that, but they were, they were heavier mirrors that you had to put the screw in the wall and stuff, and, and unfortunately, you know, how many of you men have ever felt this pain that they want the mirror to go right here? But the stud is like right here, and, and you know, and you can't shift it over those six inches because that just kind of throws the whole room off and and everything. But so you know, uh, you have to try to hit the right spots and hope that you hit a stud every now and then. And and I remember we had this little staircase, and and so she is, was like, "Well, look, we're gonna we're gonna put all of our family pictures going up the staircase." So 
So, you know, as we're doing that, I'm having to put the, the, the screws or nails and stuff into the wall. And, and then uh, I remember at one point, I couldn't even find our hammer. So we were taking a little shoe or something and trying to hammer it into the wall. And it just wasn't much success. And by the end of the day, my wrist and hand from turning a screwdriver like this was like all sore and, and everything because it just not having the right tools. And sometimes when we don't have the right tools or we don't can't find it or don't use it, it makes life a little more difficult. And and so it's important for us to to study God's word and find those tools and find the things that he gives us in order to uh, ed, you know live this life and live the abundant life that he has. And so we're going to talk this morning about a, a, a man who in his life God gave him a definite upgrade and and it gave him some abilities that he didn't have before and and we're going to look at that if you have your bible open up to John chapter 5 and We're going to start at verse 2. And it says, Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having four porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For the angel of the Lord would come in a certain season and into the pool, and, and he stirred the water. And whoever was first after the stirring of the water and stepped in was made well from whatever disease that they were with which they were afflicted and and there was a man that was there who had been ill for 38 years and when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there for a long time in that condition he said to him do you wish to get well and I want to stop here just for a second and just kind of think about this and kind of set the scenario so basically there's this place that that there was a pool of water that, that uh, at certain times of the year that an angel would come down and stir the water. And the first one to be able to get into the water would be healed of whatever type of disease that they have. So in this time, you've got this pool of water, and then you have people laying all over the place and all over the, the near the, the, the borders and the banks of it, and just waiting to get healed. I mean, that was the whole purpose why these people even came to this, this pool. And so Jesus walks up on... On, on this guy who he sees has been there for a long time, and he goes, hey, you want to get better? And you, But you got to picture this. That's the purpose of the pool. That's the purpose of why everybody is laying around that thing is because they wanted to get better. And Jesus saw that this man had been laying there for a long time, and the Scripture tells us that he had been there for 38 years. Now, do you think somebody who had been paralyzed and, and, and unable to walk for 38 years, do you think that they wanted to get better? It sounds like kind of a, a crazy question that Jesus would come up and, and to somebody who is sitting by a pool waiting for somebody to help them in the water. They, they've obviously they, been there for a long time. This is Jesus. He's already the Son of God. He knows everything that's gone on in this person's life and everything. And he comes to him and asks him, do you want to get better? It, it's almost like a like, uh, well, duh, I mean, that's why I'm here is because I, I want to get better. That's why I'm laying here. And, you know, I've been here for a while. And, and, and Jesus, the, the thing we got to realize is that Jesus doesn't waste his time by asking pointless questions. Jesus already knew the answer to the question. Of course the man wanted to be better. For some of us, if we were sick for 38 minutes, we would want to be better. If we were sick for 38 seconds, I mean, we would want to be better. That's a natural thing. And, and I believe that there are a lot of people who want to be better. But I think we're just like this man. And we're going to go on and read some more about it. In verse 7, it says, The sick man answered to him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred. But when I am coming, another steps down before me. So here he says, yeah, of, of, of course, sir, that, that's why I'm here. I, I want to be better, but, but every time I try to get into the water, somebody beats me to it. And, and you know, I'm, I'm not healthy enough to, to be able to get there before everybody else. And so you can see the first thing that he does is he doesn't answer Jesus and say, yes, I, I want to be better. He says, but I, do, I would, but this. Come on, how many of you have ever been in a sermon or something and the pastor says, how many of you want a better marriage? And you're like, yeah, but 
you don't know how my husband is. You don't know my wife. I mean, that lady can get crazy. I mean, it, it, we, we always have those conditions and stuff. And look, it's so many of us, we, we make excuses for why we are still where we are. We, we, we look at the thing and, and we say that we want to get better, but, but, but we begin to make excuses. We begin to, begin to justify our failures. We give reasons why it couldn't happen to me, my, why our situation is different from other people's situation. You would not believe how many people that I I would sit down and counsel with them, and I would give them straight scripture as the answer to their problem. And they're like, I understand that, but, and then they give an excuse. And see, as long as we still give an excuse, and, 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 you know, some of them look like this, well, it's just not my personality. You know, hey, you need to tell people about Jesus. You need to, to connect into a church and get to meet people. Well, that's just not my personality. I'm kind of a loner. I like to be by myself. Uh, or they'll, they'll look at a sin or an area of weakness in their life, and they'll be like, well, my dad was like that, and his dad was like that, and, and, and his grandpa was like that, and, and, you know, and, and it's just kind of the, the way that we always are. It's the, it's the environment that we're in. I'm just a product of my environment, and I can't help who I am. You know, or they'll, they'll start making excuses, well, you don't know who my spouse is, or, or you know, things like that. But here's the thing. Jesus is not asking the question, do, do you think you can be made whole? He's asking the question, do you want to be whole? And see, here's the thing. Many of us, when we hear those questions and stuff, we think the question is, do you think it's possible? Look, Jesus isn't putting it up to you to, to decide whether something, is impo- whether something is possible or not. Jesus is just saying, do you want it? Do you want to be healed? He's he's talking to a man who has been laying there for 38 years. So this means he this isn't something that just happened to him. He didn't just trip and break his leg and, and, and had a broken leg laying there. But this man for 38 years. And so many of us, we, we begin to put timetables on our on the problems that's going on in our life and, and, and you know our marriages or struggles, and they're like, well, you don't understand how long it's been this way. You don't realize how long I've smoked, how long I've drank. You don't realize how how long our marriage has been struggling and and so we begin to justify it by putting a timetable on it but listen God is not limited by your timetable it doesn't matter if your marriage has been falling apart one day or or 19 20 years it doesn't matter to God God is still able to bring healing and that's why this man he probably went around the pool and I believe that Jesus probably went around and saw this man was the man who had been laying in this position probably the longer than anybody else out there. That's the one I'm going to. Why? To show that there is nothing impossible with God. Look, we give up on stuff way too soon. We write God off and God starts to work and God tries to do something in our life and we write it off and, and say, well, that can't happen. We start to see changes in our, in, in our spouse or we start to do things, but we write it off and say, well, I'm too far gone. You don't remember the last 19 years. And see, here's the thing. We will justify in ourselves the, the decisions that we make based on how long we have been in that position. And God says, the timetable doesn't matter to me. All I want to know is, do you want it? Do you want a better life? Do you want a better marriage? Do you want to be free from from nicotine and drugs and alcohol? Do Do you want to be free from this? You know, there's many people who say they want to lose weight. If I, if I said, how many people in here you want to lose weight? I'd probably see a bunch of hands go up. And I'd say, okay, how many of you with your hands up? How many of you are willing to eat grass every day well, or salad, whatever you want to call it, and grilled food and exercise and do things like insanity that you got to be insane to even try to do? How many of you are willing to do that? And I bet you a whole lot more, there would only be a few people who actually keep their hands up. Because it's one thing to say you want something. It's another thing to act as if you want it. 
And see, that's the thing with God is God doesn't just just want to. It, it, God knows that that there's healing that's able to happen there. God knows that there's restoration that's able to happen there. God already knows that, but He's looking for people who truly want it, who are truly willing to to pay the price or or do whatever it is necessary. That their 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 words of saying that they want it will line up with their actions of doing it. And so this man is sitting here making excuses as to, to why he can't uh, see a, a miracle and stuff. And Jesus just goes on in, in verse 8, and he says, Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. And immediately the man became well. And he picked up his pallet, and he began to walk. Now it was on the Sabbath that, that, that it was that day. And so here's the man, Jesus, he, he's, he tells Jesus, hey, you know, I, I, I would... But there, there, there's always people that are there, and he kind of goes through his, his list of the reasons why it can't happen for him. And Jesus just completely ignores everything that he said. Jesus didn't sit there and say, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize that you had been here that long, and I didn't realize that somebody, hey, guys, can y'all please come help me? Let's get this guy in the water first. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't go through any of that. Jesus just told him, okay, yeah, excuse, excuse, uh uh-huh, uh-huh. Hey, get up. Take up your bed and walk. It's almost as if Jesus had selective hearing that he didn't hear the man's why. But, but, But God, and see, that's the thing is God knows what he is able to do in your life. See, God knew and Jesus knew when he's speaking to this man that this man was in a paralyzed state, that this man's life as, as he lived, that there could be nothing more than being a beggar and, and, and sitting around and relying on the kindness and goodness of people and to move him around and everything like that. He knew the condition and the state of his, of, of his existence right now, and he knew that he had something greater. And so he wasn't willing to listen to all the reasons why it couldn't happen because he knew that it was possible with him and if he would just listen to what he told him to do then he knew that the miracle would come forth in his life and there's so many of us that still want to just sit there and say but God you don't understand and God's like I do but you don't understand I got something far greater this is better you know, many people think that divorce is the way out of a rough marriage and, and you just go and you sign papers and, and it's all going to be over and, you, and, and that's the way to get rid of it. But it's not because you're going to carry the weight of the hurt of that marriage. You're going to carry all of those things into any future relationship that you have and it's going to ruin that relationship as well. And you're going to live that constant life like the woman who was the lady at the well who had all the, the, the husbands and stuff and Jesus stopped to her and talked to her and he said, you know, he talked to her and said, where's your husband? And she said, I have no husband. He said, that's right. You've had five husbands. And the man you're with now is not even your husband. Why? Because it's a pattern in your life. People who get the divorce and stuff, their next marriage is even more likely to end in divorce as well. Because they, they try to run from it. But listen, you can't run from the pain and stuff. You need to begin to run to the one who is able to bring healing into it. And when he says, get up, and he says to, he gives you instructions in his word. And when you're in that paralyzed state that seems like it's a hopeless situation and stuff, you need to get up and obey his word and watch the miracle that happens. And that's exactly what this man was. Paralyzed state of hopelessness. I can't walk. I can't get up. I can't do anything. Maybe it's not your marriage. Maybe it's a struggle with sin. Maybe you have a problem with, with pornography or you have a problem with drinking or you have a, a, a problem with, with losing your temper or whatever it is. Whatever the bed is that is the bed that you have been laying in for too long, the answer is the same. And God is saying the same thing. I don't care what condition I find you in right now. I have a better life and I have an upgrade available to you. And if you would just trust me and trust my word and get up and begin to walk in what I'm telling you to do. You will see this in in your life. You will see the hope. You know, when Jesus asks the man, do you want to get well? He's actually asking him, do you want a different lifestyle? 
Because this man's life was nothing but all he could do was beg and rely on people to carry him around and carry him around and, and take him from place to place. And so the question isn't just do you want to be able to walk, it's do you want your whole life to change and be better? Do you want to be able to, to walk daily? You know, he wasn't just offering him the chance to walk that day. He was offering him the chance of a new entire lifestyle where he could work and provide for himself and not have to, to beg and plead. But there's too many people that are just sitting around waiting for someone to move in their life. And, and, and they're crying out to God, if only God would move. Well, here's the thing. The majority of the time, God is waiting on you to move so, and step out into what he is calling you to do. That's why you have heard sermon after sermon dealing with the issue that you still have in your life is he's waiting for you to do your part so that the miracle working power of God can be released. It wasn't until this man began to get up that he was healed. But there's still too many people that are just laying there. He was asking him, do you want a better lifestyle? Do you want an upgrade in your life? And I believe there's four things that we can pull out of this, this story that, that, that can apply to us as, as ways and, and things that if, if we want to upgrade in our life, whether it's in our marriage and our relationship with God, whatever it is, if we want to upgrade in our life, I believe there's, there's four things here that, that we can pull out. And the first one is you have to want it. Sounds kind of simple. But like I just said, there are too many people who say they want it. But they're not willing to put actions to their faith. They're not willing to, to put feet to their faith to begin to walk it out. You see, I th kind of thought about this. I remember when I was in high school, and, and uh, uh, there would be times when I would go to uh, my cousin Jeremy's house, and, and we would be playing, you know, the latest video game and, and, and playing, uh, you know, Madden or, or whatever the, the latest game is, and, and it's like midnight or whatever. And, and we start looking at each other and kind of getting hungry and, and stuff and look in the kitchen, and there's not anything there. And then we remembered, Hardy starts serving breakfast at midnight. And come on, how many love a little bit of uh, sausage biscuit and gravy from Hardy's? Come on. And, and we, that's what we, and it would be that decision. Well, it's cold outside. It's raining. I don't care. I want the uh, food. Whatever it was, that late night craving, it, when you have the craving or you have the desire, it's one thing to have that, but it's another thing to walk out the walk and go out of your way and to do whatever it is to obtain that thing that you're craving. For, for women, a lot of times they're not playing video games and stuff, but it's, you know, how many of you uh, 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 ladies, when you're pregnant, you have those weird cravings like pickles and ice cream together. And you're going to do whatever you can find to, to get that, or you're going to wake up your husband in the middle of the night and say, hey, I want some pickles and ice cream. Go get me some. Because when you truly want something, listen, you're going to find a way to go and get it. But there are too many people that are comfortable in the bed that they've made. You see, that man, when, he, when he's in that paralyzed state and stuff, I'm sure if he's been there for 38 years, he figured out how to make his bed real nice and comfortable. He figured out the, the right way to fluff the pad or whatever to where it didn't give him bed sores and, and didn't hurt and stuff. And so for him, I'm sure that as he's sitting here, it was extremely comfortable for him just to stay here. And then Jesus is telling him to get up. And, and he's like, well, wait a minute. I can't get up. That's why I'm here. I don't think that's where so many people are, is they have heard sermon after sermon. God has spoken to them through the word, through devotions, through things, and telling them, look, it's time to get out of your comfort zone, and it's time to get up. And it's time that we quit sitting there. There's some people that they truly don't even want the help. They truly don't even want to get up out of the situation that they are. I mean, it's evident in, in, in the world today of people who they say they want a better lifestyle. They say they want to make something of their life. But instead of going out and working a job, they sit at home and collect a check. Because that's a comfort zone. They at least know they have this amount of money coming in every month. I don't have to worry about getting laid off. I don't have to worry about sweating or anything like that. I don't have to worry about any of that hard work stuff. I can just sit here and be comfortable. You know what that is? That's a poverty mentality. And there's too many Christians that have a poverty mentality in their walk with God. They get to a certain point and they just camp out and they just sit there and say, well, this is enough. 
instead of getting up and walking in the fullness of what God wants. You see those late night cravings in my house, it looks a little bit different because we'll be sitting around, we put the kids to bed, and a lot of times me and Melody will watch a show or, or uh, listen to a sermon or, you know, just, just do something uh, there uh, by ourselves at the house and, and stuff, and, and we'll be sitting there, and then all of a sudden she'll say, huh, don't you want a Diet Coke? And I don't drink Diet Coke, to which I say, No. <laughs> But see, she's not really asking me if I want a Diet Coke. And she doesn't just want a Diet Coke in a bottle or a can. She wants a fountain Diet Coke, you know. And, and when we were in Louisiana and when there was a Sonic around, it want, she wanted the Sonic ice with that Diet Coke and stuff. And, and so, you know, she'll be sitting there and she has the desire to uh, drink a Diet Coke, but she doesn't want to get out of her comfy pajama pants that she has on and stuff in order to go out and do what is necessary to obtain the Diet Coke for herself. Instead, she's asking and hoping that her loving husband, and she bats her pretty blue eyes at me enough that I would get up and I would go do it and I would go get it for her. And that's the problem is there are many people who they're not willing to get up out of the bed themselves, but they want somebody else to do all the work for them. They want somebody else to come and and pray over them, and, and that's how they get delivered from something. But the majority of the time, the way that we get delivered and the way that we get set free is by walking in the truth of God's word on a day-to-day basis, not by somebody laying hands or somebody, you know, doing whatever. That is one way that God moves, but that isn't the only way that God moves. And we've got to get out of our comfort zone. Some people, it's a comfort zone of self-pity. They like the attention they get. Everybody pays attention to them when they when they talk about how uh, uh, horrible their marriage is or or how uh, lonely they are, or whatever. And so that's the way that they get people's attention. And so they'll stay in the in in the the bed instead of getting up. They choose to stay in that mess when God is saying, "I got something better." Some of you th- to this morning, you just got to realize that your heavenly Father loves you more than what you think he does. And he doesn't want you sitting there crippled and paralyzed, but he wants to see you growing and thriving in your walk. The second thing is this, is you got to get up. After you want it, the next instruction that Jesus gave him was get up. Get up. And see, here's the thing. Obedience to God's word was the very key to the victory in his life. The minute that he obeyed the voice of God when when Jesus spoke to him was the minute that his legs became whole and he was able to get up and he was able to walk for the first time in his life. Let me tell you something. When he heard Jesus tell him to get up, I guarantee you he was like, but I can't. I can't walk. I've been here for 38 years. I've tried to get in the water. I'm always too late. All those thoughts go back through his head. But here's the thing. You've got to learn to have selective hearing as well. Because the enemy is always going to be up in your will telling you every reason why your marriage can't be fixed. Every reason why your finances can't be fixed. Every reason why you're going to be stuck in the same condition and the same rut that you are. But you've got to begin to silence the voice of the enemy and hear what the word of God says. And for some of you today, the word of God is simply this. It's time to get up and stop feeling sorry for yourself. It's time to take up your palate and begin to walk in the fullness and the victory of God. You've been in that condition long enough it's time to raise up and be the men and women of God that I've called you to be it's time to get rid of the excuses some of us well my life will be better when blank happens and if this man would have said well I will if I get to the water first if I could get to the water first yeah I could get up he would have missed out on his miracle And there's too many Christians that are missing out on the life that God has for them because they're not willing to listen and heed to the voice of God. The the third thing is this, you got to pick up your bed. You know, my aunt on on Christmas, we were, uh, we always do kind of a Christmas Eve uh, service with my family 
at, at my my grandpa's house, and and usually uh, my grandparents will kind of share it and, and stuff, and then we we'll, we'll pray a little bit, sing some songs or whatever, and then we get into to opening the Christmas presents and stuff. And this year, uh, you know, my grandpa had passed away, so uh, my mom and and Jeremy's mom actually kind of did the service and led the the Bible study and everything that night. And one of the things that Jeremy's mom said is she was actually looking at this story. And she was reading through the story, and she said, there's something uh, about the, what Jesus told him. He said to pick up your mat, not make up your mat. And she said, because here's the thing. If he would have told him to make it up, it would have meant that Jesus wanted him to lay back down in it. But Jesus didn't tell him to make it up. He told him to pick it up. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, it's time to pick it up, not make it up. This is what I mean. There's too many people that leave the same avenues of sin or the same avenues of failure or whatever. They leave those doors open because they're going to try this out. And the minute that it gets tough, they run back over here to their comfort zone and they, they sit back down. You know, they try to, 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 to work out their marriage and stuff. But then they hit this fight. So they run back over here and they jump back down on the ground because this is their comfort zone. Or they, they try to, to uh, get free from alcohol or drugs or, or whatever it is. And, and, and they, they've start feeling that temptation, and then they run back over here because this is the safe place. And as long as you have that safe place that you run back to, you will never get up and walk away and continue to walk forward in, in what uh, God has called you to do. You have to make up your mind that there is no plan B, that I know what God's Word says and that God's Word is the truth, and that's what I'm following. There is no turning back. It's like the old song that, that we used to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back the cross before the world behind me the cross before me that's the way we need to live our life is that the mat and the mess and everything before that that's behind us and we keep the cross of Jesus Christ in front of us and the life and the freedom that God has for us in front of us and we continue to pursue that instead of having the option of going back listen you got to burn the bridges that lead back to those areas of weakness you get an internet blocker. You get people around you that hold you accountable to things and, and ask you tough questions. You stop buying alcohol and putting it in your refrigerator. You stop buying the cigarettes. You stop whatever the thing is. You've got to stop uh, uh, going back to that and leaving that mat there. It's time to pick up that mat and to walk on. And that's the third thing. The last thing is this, is that we walk it out on a daily basis. This whole thing, you know, the Bible tells us that, that we are to, to walk by faith, that the righteous shall walk by faith. Listen, God has called us to, to, to be moving forward. He's called us to be advancing his kingdom. He's called us not to be in that, that paralytic state of fear or, or condemnation or guilt or self-pity or, or sin or whatever it may be. He's called us to get up from that, pick up the mat, and just follow after him. You see, every day that this man lived, he had to make up his mind. When he laid down and he woke up in the morning, he had to make up his mind to get up and walk again. Don't think there wasn't time when the enemy would come to him and, and the devil would come to him and, and try to tell him that he hadn't truly been healed. See, that's what, what, the, what the devil does to a lot of Christians today is, is they, they get up and they, they have a good day and they, they walk in freedom and, and, and everything. But then the next morning, the devil is right there in your ear saying, you ain't really saved. How much longer are you going to play this game? You know who you really are. Come on, anybody ever had that before? See, as long as your mat is still laying there and it's all made up and it's nice and comfy, it's going to be a temptation to go right back to it. But when you take it up, you remember where you were 
you remember the pain of the past that that was there and you realize that that's not the way that you want to go back to you remember the man that you were when you were coming home drunk you remember the the person that you were when you were losing your temper you remember the person that you were when you were living in sin and you realize that that's not the life that you want but you want to keep walking forward and and that Jesus even said if any man be after me he must take up his cross deny himself daily and follow me every day that man had to wake up and decide I can do this I can walk not because of anything he did he didn't heal himself he obeyed the voice of God and God healed him and it's the same way with our life when God pulls at our heart he begins to pull at our the the heart and and, and to convict us of our sin and, and show us that we need a savior all we do is respond to his word And then we get to get up and walk in the miracle of our salvation. To walk in the goodness of God. Listen, there's many of you, you're waiting for miracles. I feel like God is just waiting for you to do what he told you to do. Put the blockers on your your stuff so that you don't keep going back. Go dump out all the alcohol and never buy it again. Forgive that person. Go have that conversation that you haven't wanted to have. You're living together in sin and you know it's wrong. Move out. Trust God. You filed for divorce papers, tear them up. Whatever it is, whatever that bed is, you get rid of it. And you walk in the life that God has for you. But I think a lot of Christians are afraid that if they do, what happens if I trip? I mean, here's this man that hadn't walked in 38 years. Look, I know when I, I tore my ACL and, and I had to have surgery and, and everything. And, and here I am, I'm, I'm about six and a half months after the surgery. And there's still things that I can't quite do because my knee will, will shift or it doesn't quite have that strength or whatever. And so it's amazing at how much that even after, you know, just a few weeks of being on crutches and not being able to use the muscle, that the, the muscle atrophies and you got to build it back up and, and begin to work. And this man had been laying there for 38 years years can you imagine how atrophied his muscles were and how none of them worked or anything and Jesus didn't turn around and say hey guys I need you to come over here and help me Dwayne come over here Jeremy come on let's let's get these guys together and and and, and we're going to help you walk and and then as you begin to strengthen it and we're going to go through physical therapy for a few years and and then once you go through all of this stuff then you're going to be able to walk he looked at him and said get up and walk because he knew his power Some of you, as I say those things, you're like, but it's just not that easy. Maybe not for you, but it is for him. It wasn't easy for a man who laid there for 38 years to walk. But he did it. Because of the power of God. But you got to want it. You know, my son is three and a half years old. and, And he's a little bit of a charmer when it comes to my wife. And so there'll be, you know, he's three and a half. He's fully able to walk and run and play when he wants to. But there'll be times when we're out in a parking lot or we're somewhere, and he will run over to Melody and he say, I want to hold you. I want to hold you. And she will bend down, and she will pick him up, and she will carry him around everywhere. And it's just simply he doesn't want to walk on his own. He, he just wants mama to be his little car. He doesn't want to get dust on his feet and, and all this stuff. So he doesn't want to have to go through all the heavy lifting himself, you know. Mama would do that for me. And so she'll walk around, and she's bent over, and her back is killing her. And she'll bring him over to me and hand him to me and say, here, can you hold him for a minute? And I'm like, sure. And I'll grab him, and I'll sit him down and say, come on, son, let's walk. Now, am I being a cruel father? That boy's able to walk. He's got strength in his legs. See, Jesus knew that when he obeyed the word, there would be a strength that was given to him that wasn't of himself. That man couldn't have walked on his own, but he could walk with Jesus' strength. 
you can't defeat alcoholism on your own, but you can with Jesus. You can't defeat pornography addiction on your own, but you can with Jesus. You can't beat uh, unforgiveness and bitterness and, and lying and, 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 and all that on your own. You can't fix your marriage. You can't fix your physical body. You can't fix your finances. You, can, you, you can't do all of that stuff on your own. But guess what? You can with Jesus. And the same way that I set Elias down, I said, come on, boy, let's walk. That's what Jesus is saying to you today. Come on, get up. Let's walk.